Good morning, everybody. Beautiful Saturday here in Minnesota. This is the Ask a Painter live show. I am Nick Slavic. I'm the host of this show. I'm also the proprietor of the Nick Slavic Painting and Restoration Company. Um, this is a weekly live Facebook show where I use my almost three decades of experience in this trade as a craftsperson and also as a business owner to answer any questions. And again, I don't always have the answers, but the people associated with this community definitely do. So today, very special show. We are getting to the final stages of getting the Slavic shop together. So if you want to see this shop, the inception, when we bought it, when we moved in, the first things we did, the constant improvement, one of our core values that we're doing to this shop, you can follow along the hashtag Slavic shop. Um, also, I want to thank the PCA, the Painting Contractors Association, uh, for being a good underwriter of this. A lot of the ideas I got in this shop, you're going to see from people all over the industry because we connect via social media, we talk on the phone, we do virtual meetings, I even go to people's shop. You're going to see some things, some sneaky things that I got from my buddy Zach Kenny out in Massachusetts and uh, uh, Rhode Island uh, as well in this shop here. So we're going to give you an entire tour of the shop. Uh, I'm going to answer any of your questions so you can just type them down below. Also, what we're gonna do today is I'm gonna show you, because we have everything um, up and running and, and kind of in its 90% final state, I'm gonna show you our insanely simple bomb-proof method of basically fine finishing in this shop. So, let's go this way. So you can see a large portion of a shop is logistics. Uh, David, love to hear that. So we have uh, all the vans, uh, besides maybe one or two have the same racking systems. Uh, we have them all lined up here. Yesterday, we have a system in our process. We actually washed and detailed all the vans. So they're all here. This is mine parked wonky right in the middle here. Uh, everything secured, everything easy to get to. We'll go in. Oh, Troy. Yeah, the PCA is a wonderful thing. A lot of the things that I learn are from that. So this is what we call the lounge or the lobby here. You can see that's uh, that was a birthday present uh, from some of the art. All right, so those are orders back over here. Uh, about two times a week, we get big major orders for the company. So those are all labeled, as you can see. They'll have the job names on them. Uh, Gallet, Fitterer, Hathaway, Jacobson, Wuchko, Hogan. This and that. Uh, paint orders down below as well. And then uh, when we run out of room there, we have paint orders here as well for the week. So, all right, I'm glitching. Hold on tight real quick. Okay, so either we're switching from cell to Wi-Fi as we go in here. So you're going to see all the orders nice and neat. Um, the people who supply us with the stuff uh, will write the job names on. If they don't, our shop manager, Brandon, is responsible for that, and he'll make sure the crews all get their stuff. Um, a lot of what you see here today is a product of shop manager, Brandon. None of this stuff would be what it is without that right there. So we have lockers, crew lockers right here. Every crew has a van assigned to them. Every crew has a set of gear assigned to them as well. And they can keep all their personal stuff here, nice and neat. They got a little fine finish brush in there. You can see a pair of spray shoes down in the bottom. Uh, when we get uniforms and things like that, we'll throw them in there for them. It's just a nice way of kind of, this is a crew, this is a locker, that's your van. If we ever need anything for that, it's all there. You can see my HVLP museum up here from old stuff, things that we use and don't use, all this other stuff like that. Paint orders little wash area. This is a super cool trick that I stole from my buddy Zach Kenny, which is a parts washer. It's got an eco-friendly solvent in there that does not evaporate. And here, I'll open this up for you. And we'll kind of show you what's what. All right, so, pretty simple. This guy will move up. Like this, you got your light your string, you got your brush, and eco-friendly. Um, this stuff is not a very hot solvent, but it does do the work of a lot of the hot solvents. We use it to clean a lot of our, you know, sprayer tips and uh, and things, things like that. It gets a little putty of, of a putty knife, things like that. It's got a heater in it. It recycles it down here and filters it. And uh, I think you can go many, many months here without uh, actually changing this stuff out, which is really cool. So if you wanna watch out for the environment a little bit and do a super effective job, this is kind of what we do here. Uh, another thing that we do is that is a consolidant right there. That is a bucket of slop. 
I'll show you this real quick. You know, as we clean out sprayers, we'll, we'll take out thinner and we'll put in something else. What we do, so we don't just dump stuff down into the sewer, we actually have, it's a powder form like this. It's, it's a coagulant or a consolidant. And um, you pour it in any, any liquid like that, it'll make it inert, uh, safe to dispose of, uh, and it'll coagulate it like this. So what you'll see is it turns it into slop like this. Eventually it'll become kind of like a, a thick, dry, sort of crumbly mixture like that. And that is 100% safe to then put in the dumpster. And get rid of economically. So that's always a fun way to do that. So into the bathroom, very utilitarian bathroom. Nothing fancy to see here. Shop bathroom. But the lounge, you can see uh, a lot of times Brandon works here on his computer. Uh, and then, uh, uh, you know, lunchtime, things like that. So let's go on through. We have a nice seal here for this. So this is the main kind of work area of the shop. General layout is, oh, Jason Paris. <laughs> Jason, you have a bigger vocabulary than me. They're not economic terms, so I understand if you don't know them, but you know what I mean. You're just giving me crap here. So uh, everything, everything in our shop, obviously systematized here. So our beautiful surf prep stuff up there from the lovely Faria family. Uh, Brandon will actually use these whiteboards as his working boards right here so that as he's working on projects, sometimes he'll touch five or six projects a day. He's actually in charge of doing all the finishing from the job site. So he'll be keeping track of his hours here. We have our SOPs for our shop assistant and our shop manager weekly checklist. So I'll check in with Brandon weekly to make sure these things are done. He holds accountable a shop assistant. So what's really cool is that um, we have a shop assistant, one of our junior crafts people, who's a high school student, come in on the weekends and he actually refuels all the vans, cleans them, washes them, things like that, gets them all dress right dress so that our crafts people can show up Monday morning, turn that key and hit the road and they're never going to have to worry about, do I have fuel, do I not have fuel? <laughs> Jason Paris, Nick and I are such good friends. I need to watch his live streams while my kids throw oatmeal at each other. So, yeah. Oh, I love it, man. Also, interestingly enough, Jason, as I was cleaning the uh, last bit of the shop, getting ready, setting some things up, I was listening to your interview with Garrett Martell uh, and Jason Phillips. And if you guys have not seen that interview yet, go to Triple Crown Contracting and watch that. So general idea here is we have a prep area. So we like to have a very simple process for finishing things. Things come in, they come in this general area right here. This is a custom downdraft table built by my um, carpenter, on staff carpenter. It's got a plenum and a big industrial fan inside of it. And when you turn it on, it's, it's got rubber mats on the top and it'll actually suck most of the dust down through there. We have inspections light, inspection lights right there. We have our two automatic vac systems hooked up to our beautiful surf prep systems right there. Uh, one of the things I wanna talk a lot about today is a racking system, and it is a system. Uh, Michael Halverson, if you guys have not met him from Fast Rack Systems, is one of the greatest humans I've ever met in the industry. Uh, his business and shop is based out of Wisconsin. He makes all these things. He inspects them by hand. A lot of time he even paints them before they get out of the shop. He delivers them to contractors. He's working with contractors actively. He used to be a painting contractor himself. And instantly, we hit it off years ago when we met each other. You guys might remember, I actually drove to his shop <laughs> uh, to pick up all the stuff. I was so anxious to get it. I got to spend the entire day with him. We looked at his operations, his systems, how he does it. Not dissimilar than all the systems and processes we have in here. So. What you're gonna get with one of these is insanely good construction, and I wish you guys could be here to, to hear and feel this, but this is all ball bearing stuff like this. It is smooth as silk. What you have to be careful for with racking systems is they can get flimsy sometimes, or the wheels stink, they hit a crack and the whole thing will tip over. These things are so beautiful. They are solid. They're like a, they're like a solid truss bridge over a river. They're just amazing to work with. Uh, and they legitimately help economize our space because we can fit probably the equivalent of three or four kitchens with the simple sets of rackings that we have right here. And it's just awesome. Zach Kenny, who's just commenting right there, 
good people find good people find good things. And I know Zach Kenny's a big fan of this stuff too. So I'm not paid to say this. Uh, there's very few things that I come out about that are just so phenomenal. I have to say something. This, this show is not underwritten by Michael Halverson or Fast Rack Equipment. I will tell you, find this stuff. It is amazing. And it's a big part of what we do here. It makes for efficient systems. We're gonna get back to this and I'm gonna actually paint stuff for you and show you what we do. All right, so let's flip this around here, get rid of my ugly mug. So we came from the lounge, we come in here, we have some drawer stage here. These are in their final stage of getting varnished and this is a monster kitchen that we're doing. So you can see over here, we got <laughs> tons of pieces from there, cherry kitchen, and we got uh, drawer stage here. Uh, we have to save some racks for, for another project here. Normally we would, we would uh, rack them all up. Um, <clears throat> Michael Halverson, guys, look him up. Uh, Fast Rack Equipment, there's links here uh, in the notes. But uh, we have all of our sanding equipment right here. You can see our Festool Merca drawer, random supplies, our surf prep, random tools, things like that. Again, everything modular, everything on wheels. Um, a general idea of a space like this is if you build in a whole bunch of fixed fixtures and things like that, you're gonna be stuck with them. You'll notice wheels, wheels, red racking system, wheels, fast rack, wheels, 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 wheels. We're on our about sixth uh, iteration of this shop so far. And if we didn't have this stuff, if we just built in fixtures, it would be very costly. So, all right, we have our shop lawnmower and our shop weed eater. We have our shop chemical cart right here. Yeah. Wheels, surprise, surprise, modular stuff. 120 volt pump. We put our right here. We mix it in there. We drag this around to decks and porches and things like that. And we spray. And everything simple, everything modular. Racking systems, these, these are sprayers back here. So you can see these chairs are waiting to go to the client right here. But what we do is we actually get big rubber made totes and all the sprayers are contained in here. Not only to keep it all straight, they're easy to stack, but they also contain spills on job sites too, which is super cool. And if you guys have any questions about the shop or shop layout or anything else, you let me know. Now, what's super cool, let's see if I can squeak this in here. Um, I wanna talk about a training facility, our training facility. So. Actually, you know what, let me get, this is a better view right here. So, hope you guys can hear me when I do this. All right, so, the general idea is we have something called Apprenticeship 2.0, which is what I believe is the way to win in the trades over the next couple decades. Uh, we find decent human beings, people that generally aren't trades people, bring them in, inspire them, and train them. How do we train them? Stuff like this. You can see our on-staff partner is actually building us a staircase that's going to have all the spindles, skirt boards, carpet, and everything else. We have a, and I'll show you this in a second, we have a test bedroom, a test bedroom. It's a fake bedroom, our most typical bedroom where we train painters on. Between the staircase and here, we're actually going to build a uh, bathroom. It's going to have the toilet, the, the, the sink, and everything else here uh, to train people on that as well. Um, the thinking is a training facility where decent human beings Right minds can train away from clients' houses. We can really get some good repetitions in. And if any of you guys have seen my master's classes, I show you exactly how it costs about $2,440 to train one painter that can paint all star standard under budget and prep cabinets and trim to our standards. So you want to know more about those? Master's classes, folks. All right. We have the star of the show. I will get into this a little bit later. Our spray booth, which actually a couple weeks ago, a couple weeks ago was just finally code approved and that's why I am here. This is 100% legal now to show you spraying in this shop. Michael Halverson, good to see you my friend. I appreciate all the work you do, especially with this stuff, your awesome racking system here. So you can see we go to town in this thing. This is a production spray booth. We've had it up and running fully for a couple weeks. We rock with this thing. Uh, we got tons and tons of projects to do. On staff carpenter built us a little uh, pattern checker right there. We got our little magnet hooks right here, which they source so we can have our spray guns and, and things at the ready. And I'll get more into cost and stuff like that later. You can see more sprayers palletized right there. We got our big boy pressure washer. Uh, slop area up here. Uh, this is sort of the catch-all right now. We like to have a clean shop. Brandon, of all people, likes to have a clean shop. So um, 
Right now, we're just figuring out, scrap this, get rid of it, whatever, get it cleaned up. This is the remnants of our last uh, test bedroom. We actually used to have another test bedroom right behind us, right there. Uh, and Kevin Hayes, you, you're gonna have one of these. I will, I got some info for you guys at the end of this. I'm gonna sit down and actually talk about the cost and stuff that, so. All right, so here is, let me see if I can back this up far enough where you guys can see this. Oh yes. This is something really cool. This is one of our test bedrooms here. It is the most typical bedroom we do. It's about a 15 by 15, uh, eight and a half foot ceiling, give or take. It's got all the outlets. That's a mock window right there. This wide opening right here simulates a cabinet, uh, or excuse me, a closet door. Around the corner to that side is actually an entry door. And what we do is we actually time people and train people on how to paint a room like this. So we'll, we'll put in a whole bunch of defects in the walls, a set number of defects. We will time people, and then this is how we train over and over in the shop here. So. Uh, David, thank you so much. Nick, do you ever think, <laughs> uh, Parker, oh, Parker. Nick, do you ever think that life would be like if you didn't move into a new shop? I, so I don't regret it. Uh, we did great in our last shop, but our old shop was an old farm building. And uh, Parker, he knows because Parker, before he got deployed, the army stole him and sent him to Syria. Uh, Parker was in charge of Apprenticeship 2.0. And he was actually the one training here. So a lot of the times when you saw us post videos about that, that super tall skinny guy, that's Parker. So we have our window right here. We have our fake entry door. This is the most prototypical um, bedroom that we do. And it's basically commoditized in our business. We have a set time, a set process and everything else. So through here, you will see this is sort of on the side of the spray booth. You can see uh, we have a loft upstairs, which I'll take you to. Uh, we, so I'm not, a big, I'm not a big fan of stocking up and supplies. Uh, in college, I was smitten with something called JIT inventory, just in time, J-I-T inventory. And I love things to come in and come out in about a week's time in there. We probably have about a week and a half, two weeks worth of supplies, give or take right now, but we're honing that system in. Again, you can see more racks, more wheels, uh, we got some of our uh, air scrubbers right here. We got cabinet uh, uh, totes full of fleece that we wrap cabinet doors in right here. Uh, Kevin Hayes, how big your shop? <sighs> Want to say 40 by 40, 50 by 50, somewhere right in there. I can get the that exact measurements a little bit later. But again, more racking, more storage right here. And Brandon has honed this thing down to where we're actually getting really low on a bunch of stuff right here. Uh, we got extra racking. Uh, I'll take you upstairs in a second here. The the bell of the ball is normally uh, the supply room. So as you guys would see, we got our Traeger right here. We got sprayer supplies uh, and repair parts back there. Most of you guys saw that Thursday we had a big old barbecue here at the shop. We got some carpentry tools right here. We got our texture sprayer right here for the drywall division. A couple extra cut cans. We don't like to keep extra stuff. You'll see the automatic light come on. And then we have the beauty the beauty right here everything dress right dress james good morning your voice is tough to hear in the audio when you walk away no worries man and also james wonderful phone call uh this week as well love talking to you so you can see we have a simple process of prep tape plastic floor protection bigger plastic yard signs floor protection here miscellaneous stuff rollers Oh, ladder braces, sanding equipment, drywall stuff on that shelf right there. Miscellaneous big equipment here. We have some sticks, rags, stains and varnishes right here. We have obviously primers on this whole shelf here. A little bit of primer and then uh, ceiling paint, chemical solvents, sundries, perishables, things like that. So, And then randomly we have our stuff. We got our furnace filters for our air scrubbers, our uh, wallpaper stripping gear up there, and... Man, I'll tell you what, Brandon does the Lord work right here. Um, so, Evan, how's it going? Thomas, Isaac. Um, so, again, I am. Uh, you asked about buying in bulk. We buy in bulk from a local supplier. We love our local Ace Hardware. We love our Sherwin-Williams. We love our Hirschfields. Uh, Sherwin-Williams is our biggest supplier of stuff here. They are a big old business, and they love, love, love working with another business. So, what we don't do, there is a common misconception uh, in these things where you got a big business, you got lots of supplies, you must find some sneaky place online to do it. 
what you're forgoing with the online stuff. I'm not opposed to it. We do Amazon and other stuff. What you what you what you don't get with that is a relationship. And for the last many many years, uh, Wes has been my Sherwin Williams rep. We went catfishing. He got my boy his biggest fish he ever caught. He raises pheasants, he brings them out to my farm. We hunt together, we fish together, we hang out. Uh, we got uh, families together the last couple weekends ago. And uh, so what you're foregoing is a relationship. Just because we have this stuff here, this feels like stocking up. We will use this stuff within about a week or two, give or take for the business and the volume that we're doing. So it feels like we're going out and stocking up for the apocalypse. All this stuff gets turned over. Remember, JIT, just in time inventory. That's what we're practicing right here. So you'll see, interestingly enough, uh, we have about six cases of frog tape right here. And if you guys saw in the lounge there, we got about four ready to go. So they're going to uh, probably burn this up this week, give or take, and that stuff will replace it. We always got fresh supplies there. So David Cole, my wife is watching. She, <laughs> she said it should be taking notes. Uh, absolutely. Uh, Eric Homa. Oh, from Melbourne. All right, so this is Brandon's uh, Brandon's little supply closet right here. It's sort of, you know, water heater, things like that. But Brandon keeps um, uh, some of the more precious things in here. I'll see if I can get you guys a good. All right, so we keep a bunch of other stock, uh, high, high dollar items back here. You can see uh, simple. We only use about one or two different spray tips, so they're all right there. Our respirators, we only have one. Some random sample cabinet doors that we use here. Sprayer repair parts uh, and, and tips and things like that. So we keep a big supply, big supply of this stuff. I collect all sorts of fancy stuff that people give us. And uh, brushes down here, again, we don't have a whole bunch of crazy stuff. Um, yeah, other than that, pretty simple. This is our paint for our shop. It's all scuff -X. We did walls and fixtures and everything with that. Simple stuff, simple stuff. All right. So back on through here, you can see air scrubbers. You can see, I hate overstock, all right? Most of the stuff will be used within the next month. If it doesn't, we immediately recycle it and get it out of there. Because what you don't want to do is have a thousand gallons of this stuff, and then you gotta actually register as a hazardous waste generator with the state if you wanna get rid of that stuff, even recycling, so. Ah, Mike McGrath, do you do I have an SOP? Uh, that, uh, <laughs> you know I have an SOP. Right there, buddy. Sundry's order form. Uh, this is actually the gloss door checklist that I did with Zach Kenny a little bit ago, uh, the SOP checklist. But this is the Sundry's order form. Everything right there. So basically, he's got this stuff committed to memory. But in case we ever have to train anybody else, we have this. So this is something, interestingly enough, I am doing this right now. For the first time in my life, I'm writing my own self a job description in the company. We're to the point of professionalization where I, I am a W-2 employee of my own company and I need to actually have a job description to be held accountable to. So a little bit of marketing, a little bit of sales, a little bit of coordination, leadership and vision. Uh, the idea is, if I were to get hit by the turkey truck and not be here anymore, um, how would people know what I do? So I've, I've actually wrote it down and I worked on it all of Thursday and last Friday. We redid this for the entire leadership team too to kind of codify it and make sure that there's no gaps. If everybody has a job description, including shop manager Brandon, then when something doesn't get done, all you gotta do is look on somebody's job description and say, oh, that was the person that had that job description. So, <laughs> Mike, of course. And I'm gonna show you guys something out here too. You can see out through my little window here, that big old thing right there, the mystery box. I will show you what that is in just a second. So, Ryan, how's it going, man? All right, so we have our loft up here. So you can see, this is just a catch-all right now. Uh, this is gonna be even more training area up here. Uh, what we have right now is minimal supplies, but at the end of this, this is our mock kitchen. So we've actually set up a quick and dirty kitchen with an island and flooring and everything else back here. And this is actually how we train people on how to prep kitchen cabinets. What you'll see here, what you'll see here is that it's not been painted because what we consider most important is the prep phase of this stuff. The painting is actually fairly easy and, and gets picked up on site. You'll see some... These are portable rackings, so all the PVC pipes, the rackings, things like this. On staff carpenter Steve, master craftsman Steve made these. We take these to new construction, things like that. But I believe that that's the way of the trades uh, in the next couple decades is, at least for the painters, the apprentices, and craftspeople, the training is gonna be huge. 
also recruiting. So I do believe there's almost no painting companies that have R&D budgets, research and development. And if you want to win in the trades, this is a people business. I heard three very smart people, Jason Paris, Garrett Martell, and, uh, and uh, the other Jason, um, say this in the uh, video I watched this morning, which was, this is a people business. And if you forget about that, you will lose. So training, recruiting, number one, and then constantly recruiting and training is gonna be the way forward. So out here, we got the beautiful, lush, tropical sort of backyard. We got a creek running right behind us. Overstock ladders, we keep all stacked by size there. This thing, this bad boy right here. This is the air makeup unit. Uh, I'm gonna talk about that. Well, maybe we just talk about this right now. This is something interesting. So we have absolutely wonderful tradespeople that help us out here. My favorite electricians, my favorite plumbers in town that have been with me for years. They've done a lot of my stuff, stuff in my new house, things like that, have helped me out with this too. Phenomenal craftspeople. Uh, the spray booth works great. It's a great piece of equipment. I will say this, and I have lots of advice for people who are ever gonna go down this road. Do your research first. Look with your local city codes or county codes or township codes. Figure that all out first because I went to the spray booth company for guidance on this and the spray booth company is fine. Uh, their equipment is good, but they have local distributors uh, that will actually sell you this stuff. You can't go to the factory and buy this stuff. The local distributor that they gave me were some of the worst human beings I have ever encountered in my life. They could not work quickly enough to sell me a piece of something and then not have any support or any guidance. The big piece of guidance that they did not mention is that a spray booth is the one we got, you know, somewhere between nine and $12,000, depending on the equipment you get. This thing is about 40, all right? This is the thing that they did not say that, oh, by the way, you're gonna be required by code to have one of these out back as well. So we put the spray booth in, I call the city, I say, hey, uh, tell us how to hook this thing up, tell us how to be code compliant, and, and then all of a sudden, we had to get air engineers involved, architects for the building, uh, plumbers, electricians, everything else, and we had to do like air circulation, air movement testing, and stuff like that. The theory is that spray booth, when you turn it on, has a jet engine in it. It's gonna suck so much air out that you could actually pull the doors shut or pull the pilot lights out of gas equipment. Uh, what you need to do, the theory is, is have just as much air coming in as going out so you keep that stasis in there. Why do we have this thing? We have this thing because we are in Minnesota. It gets negative 40 here in the winter. We cannot pull negative 40 air into this building and shoot it out the top like that. This building will be frigid in no time. It actually could ruin a lot of our coatings. So what we need to do is have a monster blast furnace that will heat air up to 70 or 80 degrees, shoot it in as fast as that. That's where the expense comes in. Uh, I did not enjoy the process of getting this thing going. The city was awesome to work with. My contractors were awesome to work with. The spray booth people, their local people here, some of the worst humans I've ever met. And uh, really ruined my life for a lot of time. So if you guys are interested in doing a spray booth, please talk to me first. I am happy to help <laughs> in any way I can so you don't have to do that kind of stuff. So let's see here, the questions are coming in fast and rapid. Let me make sure I didn't forget anything here. So, all right. Sorry guys, when I walk away, the audio is a little bad there, my fault. <laughs> all right, folks, let's keep going here. Uh, I wanna talk about our finishing system. So. Let's go over here, and I will explain what we're about to do here. So, all right, about there. So, the general idea is we bring stuff into this shop right here, we bring it over to the prep table, we spray it over there, and we dry it right behind us on all the racking. The general idea and the thing that we subscribe to is something called SVT, sand, vac, and tack. We want this to be simple. I see people take an enormous amount of time prepping cabinet doors, trim, cabinet boxes, things like that. We've had insane luck with a very simple process. It doesn't take but a few minutes a cabinet door. We use oil primer and then we use scuff -X satin over the top of it. Bomb proof, never had a failure, looks insanely sophisticated. It's 
a matter of fact, I, uh, myself and estimator Andy did some cabinet doors. These are oak, just a simple process. You can see stain and varnish right here in the corner, primer, and then two top coats of Scuff-X. And this is using airless sprayers, simple things that you can get uh, from everywhere else, no fancy equipment, and basically cans of stuff that you can get at a hardware store or a paint store, crack it open and use it. No fancy mixing, you don't have to watch for humidity, you can do whatever you want. In about a half an hour, 40 minutes, these suckers are dry enough where you can put them back on the house. So what I'm gonna do right now is walk you through our simple system. We have a cabinet door right here. I'm gonna show you our SVT process. I'm gonna show you then putting it on a rack like we do. We have a rack right here so that when you SVT on the sanding table, you put them all on the rack, you wheel the rack over to the spray booth, you spray them, and then you wheel them over to the drying area like that. So what I will do now is show you that simple system that we use. You can see our inspection lights right there. I'm gonna turn on this table, you're gonna hear the downdraft, the big industrial fan kick on, and then you'll hear the sanders going like that. And I'll show you exactly what we do with the quick sand. Uh, we're using our surf prep stuff, our beautiful medium squishies, which we love. So again, if you wanna talk simple systems and processes, we use one, <laughs> medium squishy, that's it. We're not going through seven grits when we sand stuff, all super simple. So here we go. All right, so what you saw was SVT. If you got a special trained eye, you'll notice I didn't vacuum anything because the vacuuming actually took place during the sanding. Not only is our table an actual vacuum, we have, uh, for this, we have a Merca and a Surf Prep vacuum, uh, excuse me, a Merca and a Festool vacuum hooked up to our Surf Preps, and that's actually capturing the dust too. So we're actually doing two forms of vacuuming there. So what you'll see is, uh, stain and varnish cabinet door. I quickly sanded. The vacuuming was taking place while we did it. And then I tack ragged. I used a microfiber with just water wrung out really well to get this. So then what you have is a perfectly dust free cabinet door. This sucker's got some tooth now. You can see the goal is not to strip them completely. The goal is to give it just enough tooth and surface area for the primer to bite. So now with our racking right here, normally we'll do, you know, somewhere between 40 and 80 cabinet doors and they'll all go right right on this guy like this, and we wheel it on over. I'll be back. So now that we have our cabinet door SVT'd, we will come on over here and you can see our spray booth. What we'll do is we'll stage this sucker right outside the spray booth here. So in this case, we will do right about here, that smooth ball bearing rolling there. I'm gonna switch this guy around. So then we have all our stuff right there. And what you can do for a one man spray operation, you can be picking. I normally like to go from the top so that if something does drop on it, you can catch it by the time you go to the bottom. Feed it over there, spray it, and then put it back on top. Feed and rack feed and rack. Now, normally what we do too, is we have um, an apprentice here too. So one person will basically be stationed there spraying on, on the fast rack kind of uh, uh, fixtures right there, the whirly gigs. And one person will just be feeding and racking like that. And you can go through <laughs> legitimately uh, a 56 piece kitchen in about 40 minutes, give or take between all the business that happens in here. So I will set this up. Actually here, I'll show you this too, guys. We'll go over here. And you can see when it, when it really gets going, we got both sides of these things going here. We wheel them around and you can fit a whole bunch of stuff in. So we already have 
This is the control panel right here. We already have it on with the big main switch here. We have the lights on right there. What we're gonna do is get our air makeup going. So you can see we have a winter and a summer. If we do winter, <coughs> excuse me, it's gonna heat that sucker up and do heated stuff. We're just gonna do summer like this and you'll be able to hear that thing kick on here shortly. And then we'll go back over here and we will get the system going. So lights are on, ready to go. Oh, I think what we'll do is we'll restart this sucker here. Sorry, we've got to start from the start. Follow a system, follow a process. So we'll go on. Sorry, once more, follow my own system here. Back over here. All right, system is energized. All right, so we will go over here and I'll kind of show you show you the system we use. Let's see if I can back this up far enough here to get all this good stuff in here. System is on, you can hear it all running up there. And this is what we do. So a little bit of simple prep, a little bit of primer on there, and it'll be ready to go. Then we'll rack this baby back up. All right, so that's about as simple as it gets, folks. Um, shop tour, finishing, Let's see what else you got. I'm gonna run through some questions here just to see if you guys got any other final questions about this stuff. I'm happy to help in any way I can with this because Lord knows this is a big undertaking, but it's a huge step in the professionalization of a business. So let's go back through here. David, in Calgary, we have the same natural obstacles. Yes, absolutely. It's always a tough one. Kevin, is that furnace required because of your location in the cold? Uh, I'm in lower Alabama, mostly higher temps and higher humidity. So there is, yes, and, and so this is really tough because a lot of these spray booths aren't installed, right? And a lot of people do spray operations that are clandestine, under the table, uncode regulated spray things. So when I brought this to my uh, HVAC guy and I brought it to my city, they don't have a lot of experience with this stuff. Uh, in fact, they had to go reference the state code and I think that's where everything got super complicated here. Now, the city's doing their job as they should, uh, but it's a kind of a new process. It's not like putting a deck on the side of the house. So the general idea, whether it's hot or cold air or humidified or dehumidified air, there needs to be some sort of airflow where just the same amount of air comes in as out. Theoretically, if you lived in San Diego and it was a dry 72 every day, Technically, you would not need the big furnace back there. You would just have to have a system of getting in that air as fast as or, or uh, tailored to the CFM of the fan that's going out. So again, it's gonna, it's gonna be different. We have uh, two mini split air conditioning units in this place, and they're basically big old dehumidifiers for this. Um, we originally just threw the shop doors open, started finishing. Dry time slowed down a little bit, so shop manager Brandon got on the phone with our HVAC guy. We, we fixed those things up, recharged them with, uh, with uh, some Freon, and then we started going again uh, with our dehumidifying the stuff. So it's noticeably, it's probably 15, 20 degrees cooler in here than outside right now, and lots less humidity, give or take. So, all right, let's see what else we got here. <laughs> uh, Noah. Damn, I wish I could find some place uh, like this in Chicago with decent rent. So, 
<clears throat> large scale view as the proprietor, owner, and visioner of this company, you also have to understand like, if you're gonna grow a company, are you gonna do it in Manhattan? Sure, you can, it's gonna be super expensive. And the rates for painting aren't gonna be quadruple in Manhattan, like maybe they need to be just to support that. So where we are, we're in an outer ring exurb, basically. Like when you look at the Minneapolis St. Paul metro area, uh, things get really expensive as you get towards the middle. My hometown, luckily, is right on the outer edge of that stuff. So basically, we're 15, 17 minutes from anything that a big city has at all. Anything you could ever want. And it's actually creeping down towards us. We have a booming, prosperous business community in my little hometown here. We, uh, all of the work is in this southwest metro area right here. There's a beautiful thing, tons of building, tons of construction, tons of remodeling. Everything was, is within probably about 10 to 40 minutes from where we're at right here. And people say, oh, 10 to 40 minutes. Try driving in Boston from one end of Boston to another during certain times of day, and that's multiple hours. So when people balk at the little bit of drive time we do, it's there for a reason, because land is almost free out here. Uh, for instance, uh, we bought uh, 20 acres of land for my family to live on for $195,000. That included a house and a bunch of buildings, and a pond, and a stream, and a woods, and prairie, and tillable land that I rent out uh, and make money on. So. Yes, we are not within walking distance of a Target or a movie theater, but land is almost free. This shop, uh, it's expensive, right? Everything's expensive that do with land and buildings, but relative to what else is out there, it's not that bad. It's the equivalent of about a uh, $1,000 to $1,100 a month rent payment uh, somewhere there to have this place. So big investment for the company, uh, big step in professionalization. You also have to consider, you know, you can see my first principles reasoning, a, a way of solving problems, not only goes from where I live, um, where our shop is, but also our vehicles. You saw the vehicles out there. If you had to buy Ford Super Duties to outfit a fleet of 15 vehicles, uh, you would go bankrupt, or you'd have to charge so much you wouldn't get any work. We get $8,000 to $12,000 vans, they're all uniform, and that's how we build the company. So again, you just have to consider, you know, what will get you to where you're going? Do you need a big facility like this? Do you need to train people in a place? Do you need a spray booth? Do you need that other stuff? I would argue no. I've done this for most of my life. In fact, this is only within the last year that we've had a legitimate code compliant training facility in this. So I would, I, I am not here standing before you today saying you're not a real business or you're not professionalized or you're not a real craftsperson if you don't have this stuff. I would argue that you can get away with a lot less. The problem is I'm a loud mouth on social media. And when I live broadcast from some area that's spraying inside the city limits, I want to be safe and I want to be code compliant and I want to be good to my neighbors and I want to make sure I don't bring down holy hell on my company by OSHA showing up or the city cracking down in this building and putting yellow tape around it saying no more. That's not a way to build relationships. I'm never leaving this town. My family, uh, my wife and I will never leave this town. We want to have good relationships here and the city sniffing out that you're running a clandestine spray operation is not the way to build those good relationships. So that's the reason for this. That, again, like I said, I'm a loud mouth on social media. I wanna live stream from here. And I don't wanna do it with a ski mask on from some undisclosed location. So that's what we're doing. <laughs> All right, let's go back through here. All right, ooh, James, here we go. How does the Slavic crew deal with bad kitchen grease on cabinet doors? Um, it is a standard operating procedure. We just use, uh, <laughs> sneaky, an old painter's trick, right? So obviously we can use a number of things. We can use degreasers, we can use dish soap, we can use everything else. Sneaky old painter's trick, Windex. Windex has a big ammonia and uh, denatured alcohol-ish base. And honestly, <laughs> I have had some of the best luck degreasing and cleaning cabinets to the point of being squeaky clean with Windex and other kind of glass cleaners like that. So it doesn't contaminate the finish uh, when we do anything. It dries almost flashing, uh, flash dries, and it's a wonderful thing. So give it a try, folks. There's a lot of things that we do that not a lot of, not a lot of other people do. We might be wrong. I'm open to that idea, but we have a big data set. And when things come up uh, as a friction point or a problem, we IDS, identify, discuss, and solve very quickly, very rapidly, and we work to fix it. We are not unintentional about stuff like that. So I will say, sneaky old painter's trick, 
but we love the Windex. Now, obviously, if we got a, a crazy bad kitchen, we'll scrape a lot of the grease off first, scrub and, and that stuff, so. All right, uh, Cindy, what do you clean the doors with? Generally, we do not. Um, unless a door has visible grease or, or uh, tangible grease that you can feel with your fingers, uh, we won't. We'll just SVT, sand back tack. The sand back and tack process will show you if there's any of those little rubber bumpers left over, if there's scotch tape, heaven forbid that, that godforsaken scotch tape on the back of cabinet doors. When you run your sander over it and then go to you know, a tack rag it off or even vacuum it off, you're forced to reckon with a lot of that stuff on there. And at that time, you can tell if you run a sander over something and there was grease on there that maybe you didn't see before, man, we just get the old Windex out deet, 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 and wipe it off like that. It's a really good system. So, all right, let's see what else we got going here. Uh, Thomas Isaac Powell, was that cover stain? Yes, it was, my beloved cover stain. You're gonna clean that rig after just one door? Hell no, <laughs> Troy. I will not be cleaning that rig after one door. So that's set up for another project in here. Also, luxury of being a master craftsman and having a big enough business is that, I will tell you what, guys. We have shop manager Brandon. He, uh, he repacks sprayers, he does electrical repairs, he breaks them down, he cleans them, maintains them, replaces parts on them. He is a master. He is self-trained in this stuff. One of the biggest luxuries, and I almost feel like I'm getting away with something illegal, as a master craftsperson who's done this for almost 30 years, who now has a big enough business, when I'm done with a sprayer, I politely ask Brandon, like, Brandon, it would mean the world to me if you could clean the sprayer out for me. And he's like, absolutely, boss, no problem. That is a weird luxury that most painters don't have, and I am insanely grateful. It, it feels like you're getting away with something illegal when you don't have to clean out your own sprayers. Brandon's doing the Lord's work here. He is a master at this stuff, and he readily and happily puts his head down and gets the work done here, so it's awesome. Mike McGrath, always love talking with you, Mike. Phil, love the shop. Likewise, Phil moved into a new shop recently, too, and I've been it's been fun watching his stuff, too. So, uh, Noah, looking to get our own small space to spray cabinets this year. Is there anything I should look for in a Realtor or red flags I should look out for first time renting a commercial space? If you're renting a commercial space, do it yourself. You don't necessarily need a realtor. You can certain, certainly use somebody that will find something for you, but I would do it alone. Um, you always have to ask yourself, listen, I love my realtor friends, but when you're looking to rent a place, uh, I would ask what value would they add to that, unless they could find you a place that's off market to possibly rent. But realtors normally are in the sale transaction. Um, I know big urban areas, um, New York, Chicago, Miami, San Fran, you know, LA, things like that. Realtors may be in the business of assisting with leases, but find it yourself. I would also rely on a lot of relationships. This building was not for sale. It was just vacant and sitting there, and it was actually a client of mine, one of our great clients uh, and, uh, and local business owners here in town, and we had a great relationship with them. So one day I was like, you know what? We're not finding any commercial spaces, but I haven't seen activity there. Called him, him being the most gracious, level-headed person. I just said, listen, Here's a price I don't have anything to base this on, but maybe some other comps that aren't all that great. It's a gut feeling, would you accept this? And he said, yes, of course. You get the paperwork done, we'll do it. A one sheet of paper, two sheet of paper, give or take, we signed it. Within a couple of weeks, it was our building. So dealing with relationships and reasonable people is the best. If you don't, it's like head hunting. Call everybody you know, ask around, ask somebody who, asks, who knows somebody who knows somebody who knows somebody to try to find that stuff. Commercial space is tough. Um, unless you want office right now. Office seems to be <laughs> pretty plentiful. So uh, I love how you keep the process simple for your cabin. So many people try to do too much. Agreed. And what you have to understand is that what you always want to find is, you know, there's bookends to this stuff, right? There's doing nothing, which is not acceptable because you have failures. And then there's basically replacing all the kitchen cabinets. Uh, we want something in there to meet a price point and give the maximum value, lowest price, least amount of effort for the client to get them this beautiful, durable, sophisticated looking kitchen. So that's how we've interplayed it with here. And you also have to remember that this entire shop, all these processes are set up for the decent human being model, which is we don't have a lot of 20 year craftspeople in this company. As a matter of fact, the most senior craftsperson in this company besides me has about four or five years of painting experience. And it's a testament to how we train and how good these people are uh, to how much good work they put out. But you also have to think, 
What I don't want my people worrying about is humidity, crosslinkers, reducers, thinners, thickeners, ratios, what's in there, what's not in there, um, supply chain stuff. We're not going to get monster orders of, of a hand-tinted, you know, imported coatings a lot twice a week. There's just not that infrastructure there, so it becomes a pain point. We want simple systems. We have one spray tip, one brush, one primer, one enamel. What that does, it allows the decent human beings, the apprentices and craftspeople, to solely focus on taking care of the client and not worrying about whether the paint's going to work out or not. That's my job as the master craftsman of this company. I create the standard operating procedures, I test all the coatings, I come up with the simple systems, I overlay my 30 years of experience in this trade and then send them out to the company uh, for people to execute. And that's your job too, as the business owner, proprietor, or visionary uh, of the company there. So, Stephen Smith, uh, what is laid down on the spray booth floor and you need to replace it or clean frequently? I spent about six minutes vacuuming it this morning. Uh, otherwise, it's just, to, it's just to kind of keep the concrete floor relatively clean. Uh, or if we get a whole bunch of dust and stuff in there, you know, we'll just fold it up and throw it away. Uh, it's called grip right, give or take. Uh, there, it's a roofing underlayment, kind of like this weird rubberized woven stuff. It's super tough, it won't rip. Uh, if it gets wet or it gets coatings on it, it won't uh, rip or get mushy like rosin paper or craft paper. So yeah, that's what we do. <laughs> James, <laughs> nothing worse than scotch tape, man. Some of these kitchens, uh, you'll find six pieces of scotch tape on the back of every door, and you basically have to take your razor blade and just <laughs> David, I arrive back to the shop, my sprayers are cleaned out over a beer or two, and then some Dalantai. Ah, uh, Noah, no problem, man, I do appreciate it. All right, everybody, uh, Mr. Halverson, Michael Halverson, thank you for what you do right here. Uh, your racking systems, are amazing and I love them and thank you for being a big advocate of this industry of what we do thank you for turning out an honest to goodness good product there are people in this industry that are great people that have a mediocre product and their personality makes up for it Michael does not have to do that <laughs> he is a world-class dude who's putting out arguably the finest stuff you can get your hands on it's a lifetime rack um, we will only add to these things. Uh, I, I can't imagine a time where we would ever replace them. So personal thank you for making us professional in everything that you do. Uh, we are, like I said, in additions, um, we will likely be adding the entire door racking system, the passage door racking system shortly. Uh, we were waiting to get our spray booth finally in, get some more space in here, which we do have now, and now we're gonna rock and roll on that stuff too. So if you wanna see a system and a process, that stuff is gonna be wonderful. PCA, the Painting Contractors Association. Um, I want to, I, I met Michael years ago. I was probably at a PCA event, at one of the trade shows at the Expo. If you wanna meet people like Michael, like me, like all the people who watch this show here, James Alata, who I had a wonderful conversation with on the phone uh, earlier this week, these are all people that surround the PCA, the Painting Contractors Association. There is the residential forum. It's called AST, uh, Advanced Shop Talk which will be happening in August in San Antonio. Uh, you probably don't wanna miss this one. So I actually scheduled my family vacation about eight months ago, and that was scheduled after. I will not be there. I'll actually be sending Estimator Andy. So if you guys wanna go meet my counterpart on the sales team, Andy Hull, one of the greatest human beings on earth, uh, my partner in this sort of thing, uh, as we go out there and estimate uh, homes, he is gonna be there, and he's gonna be taking in knowledge, dispersing knowledge, Jason Paris is going to be there. Garrett Martell is going to be there. Uh, all these wonderful people you know and love are going to be there sharing information and open booking it, and you do not want to miss it. I hear tell that Jason Paris is actually going to have a lot of his team on there as well. So look that up. It is called the PCA Residential Forum, or AST Advanced Shop Talk. Look for it. If you can't find it, get a hold of me. Get a hold of Marsha at the PCA, and we can take care of that for you. Um, thank you to the PCA for being good underwriters of this stuff. Everything that I'm doing today is because I was inspired somehow, some way, by somebody in the PCA. It means the world to me, and it's made me a better human, a better father, a better husband, and a better business owner, and a leader for all these people here. So, all right, everybody. Speaking of uh, husband and father and things like that, family time. It's going to be a beautiful holiday weekend. Thank you guys so much for taking time on this holiday weekend to watch that. 
it's gonna be 91, 95, give or take here in the next couple days. So me and my family and our new little puppy Sig are gonna go find some water and we are gonna have an exciting uh, holiday weekend. So, all right, everybody, thank you so much and we will see you guys soon.